Scott Pilgrim vs. The World is the story of a bad person. There's no other way to put it. The hero of the comic book series, the star of the movie, the character that most of us pick at first when playing his game is, no matter how you look at him, an asshole. When you read the comics or watch the movies, there's no denying that the lazy and wannabe musician is not the hero of anything and yet we root for him in every fight. He's a failure of a person who redeemed himself after getting a second chance. Scott Pilgrim is also the story of a small intellectual property that, despite having many fans around the world and reaching higher heights than most indie artists could ever dream, never achieved the success it deserved. The movie was a failure at the box office and only found redemption years later with the release of DVDs and Blu-rays. The game, despite good reviews at initial release, only lasted a few years on digital stores being delisted in 2014. Luckily, like the protagonist, the game got a second chance with a release in 2021, including a physical edition that quickly sold out. Today, we will take a deep look at Scott Pilgrim vs. The World, the game, the winner of VG X Best Adaptation of 2010, which was first released in August of the same year, and discuss its history, story, soundtrack, and obviously, gameplay. But before all that, hi, I am Savino, and this is The Flying Kick. If you never heard about Scott Pilgrim before playing the game, you may think the story is your typical beaten up affair. You are Scott Pilgrim and you wanna date a girl called the Ramona Flowers and for that you must face her seven evil ex-boyfriends. It's a typical beaten up story, if not a little strange, because other than that you have no idea what's up. It's interesting that the game relies so much on the comic books to tell the story like it was a multimedia experience with movies, comics and games telling the story in their own way. But for someone who had never heard about it, the experience was, let's say, interesting. After all, who are those exes, why I must fight them, and who on earth are these people fighting alongside me? While it might sound I should have said confusing instead of interesting, playing a bit and up where I missed the story was a curious experience. The game doesn't have a single line of dialogue to contextualize what's going on, and soon enough you'll be fighting a guy who can summon dancing vampires or one that, when defeated, is busted by a green police car before exploding in the form of vegetables and a very familiar looking mushroom. You have no idea who these guys are, and why they are so different from each other, and why they act as they do. It was a series of what's going on from start to finish, and while it made me feel a little lost while playing the game, it didn't hurt my enjoyment. Even the cutscenes, the game has one between each level, avoided anything that tells you the story, being only some aesthetic art where you couldn't infer much more than what you already knew. The same can be said about the other playable characters. You know Scott, you know Ramona, but you have no idea who is Skin, or who is Steels, or Knives, or Wallace. They are, if you're looking from my position, a bunch of friends who love fighting. While it may be enough for a beaten up story, Scott Pilgrim vs. The World, the game, has a more complex story than you would expect if you only played it. But, as you will see, the history of the game would have an impact on that. Scott Pilgrim was created in five months, that's what you will read in most outlets around the web, but that's not the whole story. Scott Pilgrim was made in record time, there's no doubt about that, but the story is a little more complex than you otherwise could think. Talking to Jonathan Levine, one of the game's designers, Scott Pilgrim had its development started around mid-2009 in Ubisoft Toronto. The game was in full production when management decided to cancel its development, but later sent the project and part of the original development team to Ubisoft Chengdu, based in China. Interestingly, this was a Ubisoft beaten up, the last beaten up to come from a AAA studio, and yet they almost cancelled it. There is no public reason for it, but what I could find out is that the higher ups were more interesting in other projects than a small beaten up based on a small IP. Don't forget that it was 2010, and at the time the only commercially successful beaten up was Castle Crasher, and it was an indie game. The truth is, Scott Pilgrim was completed, not created, in only five months. And while the game was already taking shape at Ubi Toronto, the developers at Chengdu had to put a lot of working hours, or better yet, working days to make it ready until the deadline. In the words of Jonathan Levine, the timeline made no sense. 
but he's thankful for all the support and resource that Yubi Shengdu put at their disposal or otherwise the game would have never been finished. It's impressive that the game was even released and the bugs and the lack of an online mode become even more comprehensible after understand what was happening behind the scenes. Imagine moving to the other side of the world to finish a project in record time with sleepless nights and a lot of pressure. Not something you would wish for, I believe. All this story about moving the game and part of the team to the other side of the world makes the art of the game even more impressive. Scott Pilgrim is up to this day one of the most beautiful beat'em ups I ever see. Everything in this world was made with painstaking care and attention to detail. Let's take a look first at the backgrounds, which are mostly amazing. The first level in the game, the Streets of Toronto, is incredibly rich in details, easter eggs and, according to Jonathan Levine, filled with some internal jokes. You can notice some of that in the house's numbers and how they are not exactly, well, exact. We got I here, a 25 Factorio and a crown for some reason. You can spend a lot of time looking at these small details, especially in the first level and mainly on the first level. While everything looks very unique, as you progress in the game, you may notice that the level of detail and uniqueness of each area starts to fade a little bit. The second level, the set where Lucas Lee is recording, is very varied and you'll be crossing many different sets and facing some different enemies on each set here, which is pretty cool, but if you look at the walls and the background in general, you may notice that the level does not have as many details as the first one. If you take a closer look at the first level, you will see no repeating assets, while in the second one you can already see some repetition here and there. And this is a trend that gets worse with each level from here on. In level 3, things start to get really noticeable with very few details everywhere. We start to see more empty walls and more assets being reused on them. From here to the 7th and last level, things get better and worse depending on where you are. They even reused a piece of the first level in this one. While this honestly does not affect the gameplay in the slightest, it can be understood as a tale of a game with rushed production. Sure, things are better in game than looking at individual maps, thanks to the use of crowds to hide some of the lack of details like in levels 3 and 5, but even so, you can notice a big difference when comparing with the first level. Again, when talking to Levine, he explained to me that they didn't have too much material to work with since the locations in the comics weren't fully fleshed out as you see in the game, so they had to come up with ideas, any ideas, to fill in the blanks. Fortunately, the animation of characters and NPC didn't seem to have suffered with the hurry and change of hands in this game. They were created by Paul Robertson, an amazing pixel artist who worked in games like Shredder's Revenge, Alien Infestation and Contra 4, among other stuff like television shows and movies. In Scott Pilgrim, Robertson once again showed his talent for animating sprites, giving every character a lot of charm and personality. The best part here is the enemies, who have lots of cool animations and reactions to your many attacks. The only thing I missed here was idle animations for the main characters, but again, this was probably cut due to time constraints considering they thought about it, that is. To accompany all this top tier art, Ubisoft called the US indie band Anamanaguchi to compose the soundtrack for the game. The band, which has four members, is famous for their unique and upbeat songs created using an NES and a Game Boy. There are around 30 songs in the game, from the levels to inside the stores, and they are all very good songs. One curious fact about the OST is that, while the style of the band was a perfect fit for the game, they had to step out of their comfort zone sometimes. Some tunes leaned more toward techno and dance music, which was something new to them, as was the music inside the shops with a bossa nova melody. According to Ari Varner, the band's best player, in an interview with the PlayStation blog, some styles were created only for the game, but some of them started to shape some sounds that lately were incorporated into the band's style. Despite of some of the songs being a little out of their element, the band captured the spirit of Scott Pilgrim's world so well that they were invited to make the songs for the Netflix cartoon series. And sure, the band has its favorite songs like Suburban Train,
just like in the movies. And this is the end, the end game music, which I will play over a regular level to not spoil the ending for those who didn't beat or never played the game before. And since this is my video, here's my favorite one, Bollywood, which has a beat that reminds me a lot of Brazilian samba, although the inspiration was clearly not it. You honestly won't find any bad tunes in this game, this is probably one of the best soundtracks around and not only because of the amazing band's composition, but also the authenticity their sound brings to the game thanks to the use of original 8-bit hardware. Their work is great all around the board, not limited to only Scott Pilgrim, and I encourage you to look for the other albums and tunes. Scott Pilgrim is a divisive game. Before recording this video, I ask around on Twitter to check the opinions, and they are pretty mixed as you can see, with some people simply loving everything about the game, while others simply didn't like it or in some cases have some pretty strong opinions. The fact is, when it comes to combat, Scott Pilgrim is well represented by these comments, it's a mixed bag. The combat itself isn't bad, you have a good variety with ton of moves for each one of your 6 characters, the hitboxes are faultless and the hit stun on your enemies is very satisfying. There's also a good variety of combos at your disposal with juggles, throws, running attacks and all that good stuff. Here you can play with Scott, Ramona, King, Steels, Knives and Wallace. Originally only the first four were available to play, with Knives and Wallace being available only as paid DLC, but with the re-release of the game they both were included in the package, making them available right from the start. You can also unlock Nega Scott after beating the game with the four initial characters, adding up to a total of seven playable characters. They all have the same inputs, being light attack, have attack, block, special, jump and run with the respective light and heavy attacks, and you can call a striker as the game puts it, summoning Knife's Chow who can help your character in different ways depending on the character you are using. You can also summon Mr. Chow, but for that you have to find him on the game's world map and beat him first. As you can imagine, despite having the same inputs, all the characters are unique, with moves varying in strength, reach, speed and so on, but you won't be able to use all your moves from the start here. Scott Pilgrim closely follows the River Seat formula thanks to Jonathan being a huge fan of the game and also because the comics were somewhat inspired by the game. Here you will have to find stores to buy upgrades for your stats like strength, speed and health, and you can also buy items to replenish your life and money. Yeah, I call it mana. And even store one item on your inventory that will be used automatically in case you die. Actually, Scott Pilgrim is a game that wants you to be alive. Not only you can store an item in your inventory, but you can also use what's left from your mana and convert it to health when you are defeated. It's a cool trade-off because if you use your special too much, you risk being without anything to revive yourself in case of need later on. There are also some hidden stores that you have to find by exploring the environment that can sell some very special items, some that can speed up your way to max out your characters a lot. And here, exactly at this point, is that most of the game falls apart. 
While everything listed up to this moment is almost flawless and the combat is solid, having lots of moves and a good variety of characters and enemies, it will take a while for you to start to really have fun with this one. There's no other way to put it, when you start the game, everything is a drag. Your character, no matter who you pick, moves and attacks extremely slowly while your enemies are in full power according to the difficulty that is. And it's a good choice to start the game on the easier difficulty if you don't want to be crushed by the very first enemies. This will be minimized as you play the game, level up and improve your stats. It won't be too long until you have a good amount of moves at your disposal, but to upgrade your stats you will need to grind a lot. The items you can buy aren't that cheap and they slowly improve your characters needing a lot of them to make a difference. Or you can also buy the special items on the secret stores that can give your stats an amazing boost but they come with a huge price tag. So you will be returning to previous levels to get more money and experience and sometimes to visit a store to get that specific item you were looking for. Luckily you can enter mid-level using the map so you don't need to replay the whole level. Just start Start close to the store, get your item and jump out to the map. While this may sound like a good idea, you will only know what an item does if you buy it first or if you search on the web. The items only form what they give to you after you consume them and you will have to remember each one of them and where they are because you don't have a list or anything to help you to remember unless you write one yourself or print from the web. One thing you can do to alleviate all this grind is shit your way out of it. It's a well-known piece of information by now, but you can sacrifice one life in exchange for 50 bucks. Or start with 4 players and sacrifice their life instead until you have enough money to max out your character and play on the hardest difficulty. But even so, you will have to deal with enemies that block incoming attacks way too much and take their sweet sweet time to get up after being knocked down. They also have the habit of picking up anything on the floor and throwing it at you, breaking your combos and opening up your guard for enemies to attack. Which they will, with pleasure. And trust me, there is a ton of garbage scattered throughout the levels that you or your enemies can use to attack. Another annoyance here is that, more than often, you will be surprised by enemies that enter the scene running towards you just to punch you in the face. There will also be moments when you will be cornered and juggled left and right, taking easily half of your health. It's a very unfair game when you first start it and moments of frustration will follow as you play. The game also lacks a true go the lock zone and by that I mean you are always too strong or always too weak when compared to your enemies. There isn't that it's just right spot. Your enemies will be too strong being true damage sponges or too weak dying way before you can finish your best combo. This honestly hurts the pace of the game, making it an uncomfortable experience to play. If you do not know what to expect from it or how to deal with its shortcomings. And of course, there are the seven evil axes that I still didn't mention. They are, as you can expect, the bosses of each one of the seven levels, starting with Matthew Patel and going up to Gideon, the final boss of the game. They are interesting to fight, but your experience with which one of them may vary. Some of them are way more elaborated than others, again, probably due to time constraints. Matthew Patel, for one, seems to be the more elaborated of them all, with three distinct phases as you beat him while enemies like Lucas Lee or Roxy just blink as they lose health, keeping their behavior basically the same throughout the whole fight. The final fight with Gideon is also kind of boring. You have to face him three times on the last level. Two of the fights will happen on the middle of the seventh level, with another taking place at the end. And honestly, this is one of the worst parts of the game. After beating Gideon two times in a Row. You are thrown into his techno base, fighting robots and flying drones until you reach the final confrontation, which is just him with his sword in a fight that, while is not as tedious as his monster form, is still not as exciting as some of the other bosses.
Scott Pilgrim vs. The World, the game, may not be one of the best beaten ups to be ever released, but it is a very important one. During a time when beaten ups were long forgotten, especially by the AAA industry, his arrival made at least people recall the good times they had back in the days at the arcades or at home in the 16 bit era. Scott Pilgrim, together with Castle Crasher, paved the way for a future filled with beaten ups. Games like 99 Vidas were directly inspired by Scott Pilgrim and even River City Girls, which of course is primarily inspired by the original River City, took some inspiration from this game. With its bump story, to say the least, Scott Pilgrim vs. The World is probably the best game it could ever be. The team behind it literally moved around the world to finish this project with times and constraints imposed by a AAA studio that we now know very well how harsh it can be. Even so, we have to judge the game for what it is and in the end Scott Pilgrim has a lot of problems, many of which could have been solved if the game had been delayed. The game has a very solid combat with tons of moves and well thought characters that are varied enough to make each playthrough unique. Unfortunately, you will have to shit your way through the game or have a lot of patience to deal with the unfair and unbalanced difficulty and the enemies that are not always fun to engage with. Despite its Scott Pilgrim is still a game that can give you a ton of joy, especially if you have some friends to play locally with you. Yeah, the online is awful, it's stay local. It is what I would call a party beaten up, call some friends, open some beers, catch some snacks and go have a laugh with your friends in the complete mayhem this game can become when playing with 4 people. If you never played this game and have friends to play with, I recommend you to buy in your preferred system, but I would recommend you to avoid the Steam version. This version is plagued with DRM and Ubisoft's own online service that asks you to be online even when playing locally, so yeah, not the best move from Yubi, but one that doesn't surprise me at all. Grab this one on your favorite console and be happy. If you want to learn a bit more about the game, there's an interview with Jonathan Levine on my site, the link will be pinned in the comments. And that's it for the video, I hope you have enjoyed it and I will be back by the end of the next month with another deep look talking about Dragon Scroll, a game that absolutely blew me away since I restarted playing it this year. Please don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet, and if you like to help me out you can become a member of the channel or leave a super thanks. Other than that, I hope you all have an awesome day, and remember, keep it enough.